Hello, my name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. Welcome to SQL Bits. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about SQL injection. I've got a lot of stuff, let's get going. So the name of the session is SQL injection, how it works and how to stop it. As I said, my name is Grant Fritchie. My contact information is right here. If you wanna get in touch with me after today, and ask any questions. I love questions. I live for questions. So you've got my email, you've got my blog, uh, you've got my Twitter handle. Get in touch. I want to help out. The goals today are simple. We want to talk about what SQL injection is, what it is, how it works, and then we want to talk about ways to stop it because SQL injection is a major problem. It is not a small problem. It is a huge problem. And the biggest thing about it is it makes me angry because SQL injection is solvable. We know how to solve SQL injection. We know exactly what to do to prevent it, and it's crazy that we're still dealing with it in the year 2020. But we are, and um, we need to talk about it. Now, explaining what SQL injection is is pretty simple. There's, there's a great explanation from XKCD. Um, you'll notice that I've got the um, link to the location of that cartoon right there. I am not stealing this. I am borrowing it and I am showing you where it is located so that you can go and find it yourself. But it is the single best explanation of SQL injection out there. Anyone can understand it from this. The idea here is simple. If you're not properly writing your code, then your database is subject to horrible, horrible things and little bobby tables can occur to you. And we need to avoid that. And the thing is, is that it's ongoing. I always do a research and, and look to see if there's been any SQL injection attacks in recent times. And the fact is, is as I record this, in fact, yes, um, there was a Stanford student's crushes a website called Link, and it was attacked using SQL injection. Also, FreePick, 8.3 million records in FreePick and Flaticon, all of the information was stolen through SQL injection. And this is an older one, but it's one I, I always bring up because it, it makes me very angry. And it was iDressUp, um, my favorite website. No, kidding, I, I don't really go to iDressUp. But here's the deal. It's not simply that businesses are losing information or, or you know, adult you know, students are losing information. Children's data is being stolen. Information with children, stuff that could lead to any number of horrific crimes has been stolen. And frankly, that's horrible. And it makes me, this is why I get so angry about this is because it's not, it's not simply, oh gosh, some data leaked. It's, it's the types of data that can leak that, that causes the issue for me. Now, we can also talk about how funny it is. Now, I, I was showing this in um, Norway, and someone in the audience said, oh, you can't do that anymore, and which I found hilarious because that means at one time you could use this inside of the traffic cameras um, somewhere in, in the EU, and it would work. So um, that's pretty horrifying. But let's, let's talk about what SQL injection really is. Now, the thing is, is that what you have to have is you have to have SQL code coming from your application that is not in any way escaped, that is not in any way protected, that is not in any way a part of a coded construct such that you are not putting parameters in place. So you've got code that you build from the input of your app, and that code is SQL. And it'll, you've written the code in such a way that it allows that SQL to just be added willy-nilly. Now, any SQL database is vulnerable. I've heard people say, that, oh, well, you can't do this in Oracle. Absolutely not true. You can. Um, Postgres SQL, I've got demos of Postgres SQL doing it. I've got demos of SQL Server doing it. I've got demos with MySQL, MariahDB. It doesn't matter. All the SQL databases are vulnerable. Further, there is such a thing as um, node injection. There's such a thing as um, um, 
Java injection, there's other types of injection attacks. And every operating system is vulnerable to this. It is, it is the idea of Bobby Tables. It doesn't matter if you're running um, Windows. It doesn't matter if you're running Linux. None of that matters because it's all vulnerable. Any operating system, any SQL database system can be injected to. And several programming languages can actually be injected to as well. And so it is very, very difficult problem. Um, let me move out of the way just slightly here so you can see that screen. The whole idea is it requires you to have improper escaped input. You haven't properly trapped things on the application side. Further, you've not set up parameterization of your SQL Server and the security on your database is bad. You've got inappropriate security on your database. Any of these things or all of these things creates the situation where we can have SQL injection vulnerabilities because SQL injection vulnerabilities are everywhere. Um, it's just crazy how many places have it. Now, there are multiple types of SQL injection. There's the in-band injection, the blind injection, and the out-of-band injection. Now, the in-band injection is what I'm going to demo today. Um, it is literally doing things within the queries, within the code, using the inputs that you have to put together a SQL injection attack. And the trick is, is, is it's two very simple concepts. One, I'm going to get errors back from your code. And when I get those errors back, it's going to tell me things about your code. And so once I get those errors, I start to achieve understanding. The more errors you give me, the more understanding I get. As I then get understanding, I'm going to use a little thing called union. I'm sure you've heard of it, inside of SQL. I'm going to use that union command, and once I've got the union command running against your code in ways that you know, you've explained things to me because you've given me all those errors, I can then start doing SQL, band, SQL injection attacks in band. Now, blind injection is where you're not giving me errors necessarily, but what I'm doing is, is I'm timing. I'm running commands, because you're letting me run commands. You're letting me do SQL injection. I can put SQL commands into my application, and you will you know, return stuff, but you're trapping the errors, so you're not letting me see what's happening. But what is happening is I'm putting in commands such as await command. Say, wait for 30 seconds, and then I'm timing it, and I'm saying, hey, you know what? It's waiting for 30 seconds. If I can do that, then I know that I've got SQL injection um, uh, capabilities and I start going in. Now, out-of-band injection is a much tougher thing, and that's where you get a SQL injection attack from external code. Now, that's a trickier, more difficult thing to deal with. Um, there's a lot of good documentation out there. I'm not going to get into it in great detail. It's not very common. It's actually very uncommon to get an out-of-band injection attack. Most of what you're going to see are the in-band injection attacks and the blind injection. Um, and frankly, most of it's going to be the in-band injection because there is simple, simple scripts out there that let you do all the attacks. I'm going to do a demo um, showing you full SQL injection attacks. Now, I've been criticized in the past for showing this off. Um, oh my gosh, Grant, you're teaching people how to commit crimes. No, no, I'm not. Um, there is absolutely great documentation out there showing you how to do this. Um, and, and I'm not teaching you anything that you can't get in other places. There, there's all kinds of places you can track this down. So, let's talk some more. Now, the thing is, is that there's going to be a way to detect SQL injection. You can kind of check it. You can see it happening. It's not like it's invisible. First up, you're going to see a lot of errors because I don't know your data structures. I don't know your systems. So I'm going to have to explore and test as I go to find out what's going on. And as I explore and find these issues, I'm 
going to cause errors in your error log. I'm going to generate trappable errors, errors that you can see. And so these errors, a lot of them are, are understandable. So first up, you're going to see failed logins. You need to know that because I'm going to attempt to either create logins or take control of logins so that I can leave a back door. Because once I'm into your system, I don't want to let it go. I want to hang on to it. So I'm going to be making sure that I can get in there and stay in there. So when you see a lot of different kinds of failed logins on a production system, you shouldn't be seeing those, right? I mean, no one should be attempting to log into the production system who's not supposed to be there. So you shouldn't be seeing that. So when you're seeing those, that's a problem. The next thing you're going to see is incorrect syntax errors. Now that just makes sense, again, because I'm going to be exploring your database. I'm going to be trying different things in your database to see if I can find different data structures, to see what levels of access I get. And as I do this, as I try these different things out, I'm going to generate SQL syntax errors. Um, it's not because I don't know the SQL. Heck, I don't know the SQL. If I'm, I'm probably a script kitty using s published scripts that then just run in order and, and attack your system. I've, I've watched this occur. I'm not going to demo that. Um, but I've watched people do this this way, and it's so simple, right? This is not this is not hard. There are published attack vectors that someone can just pick up and run against your system. They don't need me to teach them. But what's going to happen, even with those published things, is you're going to see a lot of syntax errors because I'm attempting to explore. You're also going to see invalid object errors. Now, you, again, this is not something you should be seeing on a production system. No one should be generating invalid object errors in your production servers. That's just not normal, right? You're not going to see the invalid object errors. But as I explore and test and try things out, you may see these. The other thing you're going to see is union all errors, because I'm going to take advantage of the union command. You'll see how in, when we get to the demos. But the whole idea here is, is that if I can do a union command, I can pass in enough stuff to, to satisfy your base query that I'm using for my SQL injection attack. But what I need is to be able to union and then run more commands. And you'll see how that works. But as I do this, as I begin my exploration, you'll see errors around this. The next thing you're going to see is permissions errors. When would you see a permissions error normally in production? You wouldn't, right? Normally in production, an application is connecting through a known login. You've defined all of this in your code or in the third-party tool that you've purchased you're not going to be seeing permissions errors in a normal production environment. But with this, I can. I may see that stuff going on. The next thing we're going to see is changes to data structures. This is really common. You're going to see this a lot because I'm going to make modifications. I'm going to make changes. I'm going to create tables or triggers. I'm going to do stuff to your system to make it easier for me to pull what I want back out of it. Because I can't. Because you're letting me. But all of this stuff are things that you can monitor for depending on your own database system. Because again, this is SQL Server, Postgres, it doesn't matter. This is the same set of commands and errors that you're going to see regardless of it. So this is what you need to be monitoring for. This is, this is the stuff that you've got to be looking for to see SQL injection as it comes in. So how do we prevent SQL injection? Well, first up, parameterize our queries. That's the simplest, simplest, simplest solution. Use stored procedures, right? Done. Now, can you set up a stored procedure such that it is vulnerable to SQL injection? Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Don't. Don't do that, right? Make your parameters real. Don't, you know, my parameter is, you know, text, 
and and then anything comes in and I then execute a store procedure based on on whatever command I received through that you know it's just why would you do this right don't don't make that choice but using stored procedures parameterizes your input and therefore eliminates SQL injection again unless you do something silly inside the stored procedure just don't don't do that that's the simplest answer I can give you but I get it you're using an ORM tool that's fine ORM tools use prepared statements most of them by default out of the box nothing you have to do and you can ensure that those prepared statements use appropriate data types and therefore the prepared statements are parameterized using correct data types so if it's a varchar 50 it's a varchar 50 you're not letting more than 50 characters in you're not letting multiple commands in you're making sure that if it's an integer it's an integer if it's a date time it's a date time you're ensuring that your parameters and your parameter values and your data types are correct so these are our first two steps these are, and these are the easiest are part of the process use store procedures or use prepared statements either way parameterize your queries done right let's let's get that out of the gate okay cool we've parameterized our queries we're finished right we don't have to worry about it anymore well no let's let's ensure that we're not going to get it because there are still possibilities of vulnerabilities inside of a store procedure or inside of a prepared statement. So what, could, what else could we do? Well, the next thing we could do is we could validate all the user input. We could ensure that no one could in, add something, you know, the name is tables, semicolon, you know, drop, you know, or, or, or Bobby, semicolon, drop tables, whatever the heck, whatever the heck the SQL injection attack is in Bobby tables. I forget now. Um, regardless, we've got to validate our user input. Just as we're using the correct data types and parameters, date, time, string, you know, int, whatever, we need to ensure that the fields in our app are date, time, integer, string, and limit the length of the string appropriately, all the rest of the stuff. In other words, write the code the way we're supposed to write code, right? This is... I, I I can't believe in 2020 we're not ensuring that our data types are correct in the application. I mean, I used to be a developer. I wrote code back in the 90s for crying out loud. And you know what we did back then? We put the appropriate data types into the code to ensure that it, when it went into the database, it was the right data type. You know, so we didn't put strings where it was supposed to be dates or strings where it's supposed to be numbers. Everything had an appropriate data type. Then, why would it not do it now, guys? Come on. It's crazy. Next, implement error handling. Trap the errors. Don't report the errors back to the user. I mean, at least not raw errors. Letting Telling me, oh, no, gosh, that table doesn't exist in this database. And give me the database name and all the rest of that fun stuff. No, trap the errors. I mean, come on, let's face it. Anybody who's been chosen as a deadlock victim feels a bit upset, right? Nobody wants to be a victim. I'm not a victim, I'm not. Trap the errors. And finally, and this one's huge, use the least privilege principle, right? There's no reason on God's green earth why SA privileges are required for, you know, your football pool application, right? It's just not necessary. There's way too many applications with way too much security breaches because we're not following the least privilege principle. Ensure that if someone can get into one database, that's the only database they can get into. If somebody can run a query and say that they can only run that query, they can access one table, make sure they can only access the one table. Limit people's capabilities of getting into your system and taking control of them. That is one of the best ways to ensure that you're covered is through the least privilege principle. Now, these are the big ticket items, right? If you get this right, 
you're okay. But there's more. We can do additional things to ensure that we're protecting our system so that we're not leaking data all over the internet. First thing is, is use encryption. Use encryption at rest, use encryption in motion. Ensure that if someone gets into your systems, gets a hold of a backup, for example, it's encrypted, right? They can't do anything with it because it's protected. And if you're protecting your information that way, it's, it's an added benefit that you've got your information encrypted. Next thing is hash a value. There's, yeah, hashes can be broken. There's ways to undo hashes. But why would you store, say, a credit card? or, you know, a child's address in clear text. I mean, surely we could mask that off in some way inside the database in a hash in, in such a manner that it doesn't slow down performance. We can still get things in and out, no problem. But we're hashing the values that need to be hashed so that, so that we're not just showing people everything. Next up is segregate your data storage. You, great, you, you've put together a football pool. Does it really need to go into the HR database? I mean, people do crazy stuff with their data. Well, I, I get it. I mean, I see it all the time. I mean, it's just, it's nonstop just how many crazy choices people make. But segregate your data storage. Separate the data storage so that you've got data stores, you know, for finances here, for HR is here, and the football pool is over there someplace, right? Separate them out. Turn on database auditing. Make sure that you've got a way to track the changes in your system so that you know, well, hang on, we deploy on Tuesdays. This table got changed on Thursday. Did anybody do an emergency deployment? No, okay, well, gosh, maybe we're being hacked. I mean, track who's accessing the database. Track what they're doing. Track how they're doing it. Ensure that you've got knowledge of your system. Speaking of which, track your errors. Log your errors. Know what's happening on your systems. All of this, plus the things that we talked about in the previous slide, this is how we prevent SQL injection. Now I'm going to show you some uh, additional information here. Um, there is a whole bunch of data and I've, I've spread it all across, and these are all links available on the slides, which are downloadable. Um, the slides are also on slideshare.net, and these links, there's a whole bunch of them, they're really funny. Um, the o uh, Well, not really funny, but some of them are really depressing. Um, the OWASP Top 10, OWASP has got um, a publication on security, and they've got some fantastic information about it, um, all about SQL injection. And the OWASP site will show you how to do SQL injection and how to prevent SQL injection. They will show you in-band, out-of-band, um, blind. They've got demos for everything, and they've got it in multiple languages. So there's no excuse now for knowing what it is. Um, also, I would really recommend SQL injection uh, attacks, a cheat sheet for business professionals. Um, that is a fantastic article aimed at management. Get it in front of your management team. This is a huge, huge win for, for management. They can see what's happening. You can ensure that they know what's going on, that they're not going to be in the dark about it. And they will then recognize what a problem it is and that you need to solve it. So that's, that's great. Um, SQL injection defense in depth, SQL injection to how to work and how to stop it, picking over the bones, um, how to detect SQL injection attacks, all really good articles, just detailing in more and more and more detail everything that I'm telling you today. I mean, um, some of what I'm telling you today is defined in um, picking over the bones of a SQL injection attack. It was all put together by Phil Factor, and I'm using some of his code today um, with permission. Um, and that's, that's all there available. Um, now, if you want to laugh, you go to the SQL, SQL I Hall of Fame. SQL I is a short term for SQL injection. Um, there's some really good information there. And then also Python SQL injection to show, so show that stuff. It's 
the information is out there. The information's been out there for more than 20 years. We've known about this since the 90s, since the mid to late 90s. I forget exactly when we figured it all out, 97, 98. Um, we've known about it forever, yet it's not solved. Um, we're still dealing with the same stuff, and we, it just needs to stop. It just needs to stop. But you know what? Let's pause here and go to a demo. So for my sample code, for the demos today, what we're running is a Node.js server. And the Node.js server is over here. It's running. It's going to collect stuff. It might crash once or twice as we do the demos, but we'll get right back into it. Let's go ahead and take a look at the code that it's doing so we have an idea of what's going on. Um, it is right here. So it's pretty traditional stuff. It's putting everything together. It's listening on port 8081. You can see that right there. Um, and then it's it's using connection pooling to make the connection. Um, it's, you know, the whole thing is like, you know, it's an example procedure. But what it's doing is, is it's running select star from sales.customer where customer ID is equal to, and then it's putting in the parameter values that I pass in. This is a classic, 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 simple example of a SQL injection vulnerability. There it is, right there, plain English, you can't miss it. That command, this is my string, execute my string, build my string based on this value. I don't do anything to prevent the value from being anything that it can be. I haven't put limits on the length. I haven't put any kind of limits on it at all. Now I do have a second command. Let me show you that one too. The second command is to run a store procedure. So it defines the store procedure. Um, it's USB get employee managers um, and it passes in a parameter and executes that store procedure. Right, nothing, nothing tricky there. Cool. So let's start with invoking the command to a store procedure. Let's see how a store procedure works first and then we'll start hacking. So the store procedure, it runs, we get data back. Cool. Can we override it? Is there a way to take control away from the store procedure call and do a SQL injection attack? Nope, nope. However, I do now know that you're not doing error trapping, which adds to my ability to hack your system. Cool. What else is going on? Can we try this? Can we try combining OR1 equals 1 to return everything? And the short answer is no, that's not working. Okay, fine. Um, can we add in our own values? I mean, can I maybe slow, but could I just walk through the numbers? And yes, I can actually add in values. So the lesson here is very simple. Store procedures protect you from SQL injection attacks. Obviously, we've, we've demoed that, but store procedures are not magically preventing you from getting hacked because the way you've written the code, I've got the capability to run anything the way I want to, passing in any value, and so I could walk through and retrieve any of the data that is exposed through this in this manner. So that's one issue um, separate from SQL injection, but it's it has to do with how we write our code leads to how you know how well we can be hacked. So just just a bit of an example. So let's do SQL injection. Now we're going to invoke the other command, right? The 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 SQL command wherein we're building the string. And so it returns and it returns the data. Okay, cool. Well, can we do the same thing as we did above? Can we you know again remember this is all exploration. I'm going to say that a lot. I, I have to, I can't help myself. But we're going to try different things and see what happens. Well, can we pass in our own value? Yes, we can. So we can pass in our own value. So just as before, we could walk through your system and steal data. Okay, well, can we just pass anything? Can we just, what happens when we run a string? Okay, well, string says, no, 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 no. That's not a valid thing. That, that caused the syntax error. So, you know, you can't do that. Okay, fine. Well, can we do this? Can we, you know, put in a semicolon and select silly? No, no, you can't do that either. It's expecting a very specific set of columns, right? So we have to make sure that we run within the set of columns that we've defined. 
okay, cool. Let's see if we can do this. Pass in the value or one equals one. And there it goes. So what I've done is I've stolen all the data, at least all the data that you're exposing to me through this query. So this one query, I've got everything. I'm pulling it all together. I can bring it all back. And there's nothing you can do about it at this point. Um, you've set it up such that um, you've got a SQL injection vector built right into your code. And I've taken advantage of it to retrieve all that data. Now, we're not done. That's, that's just the start. So, now that I've done that, what I want to do is, I'm, I, I don't care about that data anymore, so I'm going to put where 1 equals 2. right? So I'm going to use an AND, AND 1 equals 2. Well, 1 never equals 2. The AND statement gets built in because of the way you've written the code. Cool. But I've already got all that data, so I don't need to, I don't need to query that data ever again. So I'm putting in 1 equals 2 so that I get rid of it. I don't, I don't want to look at that data anymore. But I am going to do a union all. I'm going to make sure I've got the columns laid out correctly because we have to lay out the columns the right way, right? And I have seven columns. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, seven columns. Um, so I've laid it out, so I've got seven columns. But I want to find out, what, what can we find out? Can, what can we see? Can we see the database name? Can we see the server name? So let's, oops, let's highlight this correctly so that we can execute the query. Cool. And there it is. Down below there you see testbed, SQL 2017, AdventureWorks 2017. I've got what I want. I can hack your system now. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm in. Um, awesome. Well, let's see what all I can do, right? Let's find out. Let's explore your system. Let's run more queries. So the next query I'm going to run is I'm going to find out what level of security do I have? What, you know, the login that you've given, you know, that I'm passing through in this case, um, what, what level of security does it have? Well, let's find out. Yeah, so we look for disk admin, security admin, server admin, um, uh, sysadmin or server admin. And the short answer is all of those are available to me. Um, I know what the database is, I know what my login is, I know what my role in the database is. And yes, on the database, of course, since I've got sysadmin, obviously I'm database owner, security admin, access admin, and DDL admin. I now know exactly what I can do. Further, you've exposed it in such a way that I can do anything. I've got the world at my fingertips at this point. But running this query would have told me what level of stuff I could do. Now, it could be that from a server level, I don't have disk admin, security admin, sysadmin, server admin. But within the database, I'm database owner. Or within the database, I have access. Or, you know what I mean? And so by exploring the system, I now know what level of access I have. The fact is I've got everything, so let's go spelunking. Let's, let's explore this cave. So again, using union, union's my buddy, union's my pal, let's select the object ID, the table, the modified date, the scheme ID, and the principal ID. And there we go. There's your entire database schema. I've got all of it. I now know everything inside the database. So I can start putting together queries and pulling information back. But you know what? I'm lazy. Um, I'm a thief. I'm, obviously, I'm lazy. Let's just do a search. Let's make our invoke our rest method call union select from sys objects, um, sys columns, and pull together the object name, the ID, the column, and look for anything that says credit card. Just figure that's like, you know, credit or card or anything like credit card, okay? Let's just track that down. And hey, look at that. Credit card type, credit card number, expire month, expire year. Um, 
awesome. I've got all kinds of data I can get now. All right, well, let's, let's go get it. Again, one equals two, union select. And sure enough, there it is. So, at this point, I may be done, right? It could be that I'm finished. Um, maybe all I was interested in is getting a list of credit cards that I'm either going to exploit myself or more likely I'm going to sell to others to exploit. Um, but I've got it. I've got everything I need. Um, all the credit card number, all the credit card information. Could I add in the usernames? Certainly I could, right? It's all available. It's all built into the system. It's all queryable. I can pull it out. Um, I just have to explore the tables a little bit more to pull that information together. But as it is, I might be done. I may have hacked your system and taken everything I want. Yay, I'm a winner. But maybe I want more, right? What else could I get? Let's stop this. Cool. What kind of security is your server running on right now? Well, you know, let's find out. Ah, cool. It's running mixed authentication. It tells us what we need to know. We can create multiple logins in any way we want to. Awesome. Well, now that we know it's mixed, let's go ahead and create a back door. Now, this won't work because I've already run this several times today. <laughs> so this will create an error. But the whole idea here is, is that I'm going to create a login called MS Security Monitor. Right? So Microsoft Security Monitor. A junior DBA is going to see a login like that and go, oh, well, that must be important, and leave it alone. They are. Right? I mean, it's just, it's that simple. So, and also, I put in a funky password with numbers and capital letters and lowercase numbers, um, the lowercase letters, so that I can bypass your security settings. If, you know, if you've got standard security stuff, I've got it made so that I can do that. And now I've added my role to sysadmin, and um, cool, I can now do whatever I want under my control. I don't need to worry about you changing logins or doing anything else. I've created my own login and password. Does it work? Well, let's use execute as to see what happens. Yep, it worked. It worked fine. So I've got full control through my own login now. Um, well, full control of what, right? That, that's because that's the next question. I mean, what, what else have you exposed? Well, let's run this command. Okay, you can't. All right. Well, let's make it so we can. Let's reconfigure, make it so it does ad hoc distributed queries, right? Let's make it so we can do what we want to do. Because after all, I've got SA. So make those commands. All right, cool. Oops, unable to connect to... Okay, one second. Yep. <laughs> Always crash it on that one command. I forget that it does that. have to change the code a little bit. Let's try this again. There we go. So now I've reconfigured it. Um, just doing simple commands. I know how to do this, right? And it's not even so much I know how to do this. I've got a script I downloaded from someplace and it does all this work for me. So I'm now set up so I've got the distributed commands. Um, let's run that command again, the one that we couldn't run before, and see what we get back. Ah, now this in this case, we've made it so that this thing won't run. Cool. That's, you know, at least one place we've, we've run a command where it's not going to work. Well, can we take control of the operating system? Can we, you know, go in and start running things from XP Command Shell? Yes, we can. Cool. Now that we're in XP Command Shell, what else could we do? Well, let's try getting a directory listing. Can we do that? Well, it worked, but we didn't get anything back. So... Can we create a temporary table? No, no, that caused an error too. Well, okay, wait, it's because we didn't write the code correctly. Fine. Let's get back in here, run it again. 
Aha! We've written the code correctly, so now we can get in. So it's all about finding these steps, taking these steps, exploring the space one step at a time to figure out what we can do. Once we know that we can get inside here, then we, you know, let's go see if we can do a directory listing. I don't think we can. No. Invalid object. Okay, cool. Let's try this way. Can we do this? Create a table and insert everything into the table. Yes, that worked. So now all we've got to do is pull information back out of that table and, and off we go. There we go. I've got a full directory listing of all the directories on the system. Uh, <laughs> this is fantastic, right? I've got everything I want. There's just nothing I can't do now. Your entire system is exposed to me in a way that you can't get away from. There's just very little you can do at this point. Well, okay, so we can't get out on the network. Can we try running this? Can we make a directory called backups? Cool, we can. Awesome. Um, can we back up the entire database? Right? We can. I'm not going to. Can we run an FTP process to then pull all the backups that we created? And the simple answer is yes, we can. We can FTP out every single bit of data from your system. We can run full backups and pull everything back. We can look at the server. We can control the server. From here, we would start to explore, can we connect to other servers on the network? If we can connect to other servers, can we pull data from them? Can we FTP data across from those? The world becomes open to me, depending on how I set this up and what I've done. Finally, if I'm a good hacker, um, I'm going to go through and reset everything. I'm going to turn stuff off. I'm going to remove the directory. Um, I'll leave my logins in place, but, you know, other than that, I'm going to clean things back up so that when you come in to look at your system, it looks okay. So, yay, off we go, right? It's it's that easy. Off, we, You know, we can do any kind of hacking we want. This is SQL Injection. On display. This is how it works. This is what it does. This is how we expect to see it come out. Now, I said earlier we can monitor for SQL injection. Let's switch over and take a look at my monitoring tool for a second. Now, what I've done is I've set up so I can capture specific things inside my monitoring tool. Um, so you'll notice I've got a suspicious error alert letting me know that, hey, these errors that are normal to SQL injection are occurring and probably something you know needs has needs to happen. So we've got the suspicious error alert. There's been a change to a login role or user. I'm also tracking the audits to see you know who's making changes to what. Um, I've got a configuration setting change that has occurred. So I've got another alert letting me know that. And I've got two alerts telling me that databases have drifted, meaning there's been changes made to databases. Databases have changed their fundamental aspects. Someone has been building tables and stuff out of band, not part of my process. Or maybe even part of my process. I mean, you could still generate the alerts when you made changes. But I've got alerts in place letting me know that all these things happen. Now, how do these alerts work? Let's go take a look at the suspicious errors alert. And again, this could be on anybody's system, right? This isn't, there's not, not the, I'm not demoing this. I'm just, I'm using what's easy for me because I'm lazy. Let's take a look at the suspicious errors. And so this is running a query. And the query it's running is right here. It's a little hard to see. We'll zoom in for you. There we go. Now the query I'm running, get out of my way. There. I am running uh, an XPath query against XML against a, an extended event session. Well, extended event session? What, what the heck am I capturing in extended events? Well, let's take a look. So 
So here I've got the session up, and what I've done is, is I'm going to capture the error reported event. It's a very simple event. Um, it captures a bunch of other stuff too, database drop, database created, a whole bunch of additional metrics um, in and around some very specific types of behaviors. But the error reporting, I've got it set with a set of error numbers that are fairly indicative of SQL injection attacks. So with these numbers in place, inside of an extended event session, I'm now monitoring my SQL Server instance. So this is how we're monitoring. There's, there's a whole bunch of ways you could do it, um, but I'm choosing to, to do it through extended events. Um, extended events is by far the better way to get this done, but the basic concepts are, are right there. I'm, I'm using extended events, capturing the errors. I've got the monitoring tool that's going to let me then alert on those errors so that when things occur, I know that they're occurring. I'm able to tell that somebody's trying to hack my system. All right, so that's pretty much the demo. What we've shown is um, how to do SQL injection, the fact that it's you know not that hard to do. Um, we've shown how to prevent SQL injection through the, through the use of the store procedures right at the beginning. That's the first thing we showed. And the important part here is not simply how to prevent SQL injection. The important part is how to monitor for it, because I know that a lot of you are not going to be able to make changes to your systems immediately. I mean, you are going to get your bosses to read that article that I suggested, right? Get Pass that to them, make them read it. But you're probably not going to be able to change things immediately. So what do you do instead? You set up monitoring so that you're able to watch and, and prevent, or at least know, that it's happening and, and get in there and stop it if you can. Um, that's, that's the goal. All right, so let's, um, oops, not this. Not this, not this. We need to minimize this. There we go. So remember, this is the one we want you to, um, a, a cheat sheet for, the, for business pros, right? That's the one that everyone should get their bosses to read. So my goal here today has been very simple. I want to eliminate Bobby tables. I, I just, I want Bobby tables to be gone. I want, I don't want Bobby tables to, to exist. Um, I, I want it to become, you know, grandpa, can you explain this joke to me? It's not funny. I don't get it. What's it mean? Right? The SQL injection Bobby tables joke. Um, we've known about SQL injection since the mid nineties. Um, there's no excuse anymore for uh, SQL injection to exist. It, it, we've known how to work it. We've known how to fix it. It's, it's a known issue. Let's eliminate Bobby tables. Let's get rid of them. So how do we do that? Just to repeat, just to let you know. Parameterize the queries. It doesn't matter if we're using store procedures or if we're using parameterized statements. Either one works. Parameterize our queries. Every ORM tool supports parameterized queries, so there's no excuses because you're using an ORM tool. Every major SQL database supports either a parameterized query or a store procedure, or both. Most of them support both, so there's no excuse. Validate the user input. Dates are dates. Strings are strings. Numbers are numbers. Nobody mixes them up. Limit the size of it. If it's a if it's a 50 character string, make sure it stays within 50 characters. That that alone would eliminate a lot of SQL injection attacks. You saw how much how big some of those strings got, and and believe me, in, in the script kitty stuff, there's even bigger ones. Put in error trapping. If we trap the errors, they can't explore. Yes, they can still do the out of band attacks or sorry, the blind attacks where they, where they time it. Um, but, you know, at least they have to work harder. Make them work harder. And then finally, use the least privilege principle. The fact that I'm SA, the fact that I'm DBO, the fact that so many applications are written this way, we've got to stop. We've got to get away from this idea that anybody can have access to anything at any time. Um, this is how we stop it. We've got to do this. We have to eliminate little Bobby tables and you guys have got to help me. Now, hopefully today hit these goals, right? Hopefully we, you've got now an understanding of what SQL injection is, how SQL injection works, and 
most importantly, how to stop it. And, and stopping it isn't easy. I, I freely admit stopping is not easy because all of the existing code that's out there. But now you also know how to monitor for it and identify the fact that you may be seeing it. So you've got the ability to look for the particular errors, um, then track those down and, and prevent them. And that's it. That's, that's the idea that we, we've, we have to go for. So hopefully um, this covered everything you need. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying SQL Bits and all the rest of the, of the sessions. And thank you for watching. I really appreciate your time. Um, please get back in touch with me if you have questions. You've got my contact information. Please use it. My name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. And I love SQL Bits. Great event. See you guys later.